Hey guys, my name is Rachel and welcome back to my channel or if you're new here, welcome to my channel. Today's video is a very special video because it is in collaboration with the beautiful, wonderful, and talented Brooke McKenna. Brooke is another true crime YouTuber who covers things like missing persons cases, mysteries, older cases, things like that. I absolutely love her and her work, so definitely make sure to subscribe to her channel. Also, I recorded a video with her that will be on her channel as well, so make sure to go ahead and check out that video. So the case that we have for you today is a very interesting one because it's technically unsolved, but a lot of people have very strong beliefs about what they think happened. This is such a huge case with so much information that it would be impossible to cover every single detail in this video. So this will be a pretty good outline of everything that happened and the evidence and the trial that took place. But if you really want to find some deeper information, make sure to do some research on your own. I highly suggest it. I saw a lot of good podcasts about this case, a lot of opinion articles on what you know they think happened, different theories, a lot of more recent articles actually. So definitely make sure to go ahead and check those out. With all of that being said, let's just go ahead and get right into today's case. Today, we are going to be talking about the Bain family murders. Robert Bain and Margaret Colon were married in 1969 in Dundee, New Zealand. Together, they had four children, David the oldest, Arawa, Laniette, and Stephen the youngest. In 1974, the family moved to Papua New Guinea, where Robin worked as a missionary teacher. In 1988, the family moved back to New Zealand where Robin became the principal of an extremely small school called Terry Beach School. By 1944, the family was living in a house at 64 Every Street, Anderson Bay in Dundee, New Zealand. Also, I just want to pause for just one second and I apologize if I say any of these things wrong. It is a case that's not from the US, so a lot of these different names, I'm not sure how to pronounce, so I'm just doing my best, but Let's just get right back into it. So at this point, Robin and Margaret's marriage was pretty strained. Robin was sleeping at the school during the weekdays and slept at home on the weekends, but he wasn't sleeping inside the house. He was actually sleeping outside in the backyard in a rundown trailer. Also at this point, David, again, the oldest of the four children, was studying music at Otago University and was working part-time delivering newspapers every morning. Arawa was going to school to become a teacher and Leniet had a job and she was living outside of the family home and Stephen, the youngest, was still in high school. The early hours of June 20th, 1994 started out as any other day. David went to go on his newspaper route before he went to class that day, as he did every morning. And when he came home, it was around 6.45 a.m. and he would go to the basement to wash the ink off his hands from handling all of the newspapers when he would decide to throw some clothes as well as his father's green jumper into the washing machine to do a load of laundry because that is something that he always decided to do for the family was do their laundry. After this he went up to his bedroom where he found some bullets and the trigger lock for his 22 caliber rifle on the floor in his bedroom. This was very odd and he had previously left all of the lights in the house off so he decided to head upstairs, turn all of the lights on to, and to see where everyone else in the house was. This is when he discovered that his entire family had been shot. Margaret had been shot in the face as she sat up in her bed. 19-year-old Arwa and 18-year-old Lynette had also been shot and Lynette was only there because there was a family meeting the night before. She normally wasn't at the home. They both looked as though they had been shot in their sleep, but 14-year-old Stephen looked as though he had tried to get up and fight this attacker off before being shot. At this point, David found his father, Robin, in the lounge, also shot in the head with the rifle next to him. This was David's rifle. On the computer, someone had typed in, sorry, you're the only one who deserves to stay. Of course, this was absolutely terrifying. So at 7.09 a.m., David immediately called 111, which is New Zealand's version of 911. He sounded completely distressed and said, they're all dead. My family are all dead. <laughs> Every street. 65 every street. They're all dead. Who's 
you all did. My, my family, they're all dead. Hurry up. It's okay. Every street that runs off, off <laughs> Somerville Street. Yes. What number are you calling from? Four, four, five, four. Mm -hmm. two, five, two, seven. 2527. 2527. And your last name? Bain. Bain. Okay. We're on our way. Okay, Mr. Bain. It will be there very shortly. When police arrived and saw this horrific scene, they could not wrap their minds around who would possibly want this entire family dead. This led them to immediately look at either Robin or David as being responsible. They thought that maybe Robin shot his family and then took his own life, or that maybe David shot them all so that he would be the one to inherit the family's wealth. The house they lived in was in pretty bad condition and the family had been putting aside money to rebuild the house, so they wondered if that would be enough for David to want to get rid of everyone so that he would get all the money instead. But then on the other hand, as I mentioned earlier, Robin and Margaret's marriage was falling apart. He was living outside of the house in a trailer or at the school where he worked. He wasn't taking care of himself and according to others, he was pretty depressed. It was also reported that there was a possibility of Robin being sexually interested in his own daughter Lineette who had moved out of the family home just months prior. It was said that in the family meeting that we had mentioned earlier, Lineette was going to out Robin for pursuing a sexual relationship with her, his own daughter. Was this enough to make Robin snap and turn the gun on his entire family? While both men seemed to have a motive and a means, police turned their sights to David pretty quickly. All the signs seemed to point directly to him and he was the only survivor of the entire family. So David was charged with five counts of murder and went to trial in May of 1995. The prosecution claimed that David had been the one to kill his parents and his siblings that day and that he had done so before ever going on this paper route. They said that he had waited until his father came in from the trailer where he slept outside to shoot him as well and then David himself wrote the note on the computer making it look as though his own father had done it to the rest of them. They said that David's motive was to receive the family's inheritance money. However, the defense was saying that Robin was actually the one who did kill his entire family before killing himself and that David was out on this paper route the entire time this was happening. A witness said that before they were murdered, Lynette had come forward to them saying that she was actually in a sexual relationship with her father, Robin. and that she was planning on telling everyone what they were doing right before they were murdered. But the court found him to be an unreliable witness and it was completely thrown out what he said. And so the defense then began to say that if it wasn't the sexual relationship that made Robin do it, it was the fact that his marriage was failing and that he was having to sleep outside or in his workplace and that he just snapped under all of the pressure. So the first piece of evidence was the green jumper that we mentioned earlier. There were fibers from that green jumper jumper under Steven's fingernails that they believed were there because of how hard Steven fought his attacker. Now, the green jumper did actually belong to Robin, but the prosecution said that David was actually wearing it that morning and then put it into the washer after he finished killing his entire family. The next thing prosecution pointed to is the fact that from the time David had entered the family home after his paper route to the time that he called police, there was actually 25 minutes of time that went completely unaccounted for. Of course, the prosecution claimed it was at this point that he was killing his family, but David said that he was just in complete shock from finding his entire family murdered and was going around to each person in the home to see if anyone was still alive and was just kind of walking around in this dazed and confused state. It was also at this time that David said that he heard his sister Laniette gargling when he was going around finding everyone. Obviously, this would have been completely traumatic 
but the prosecution actually said that the gurgling only happens directly after someone passes away, so he must be the one responsible, but this was actually proven to be untrue. Next, after testing blood and DNA from the crime scene, it came back as inconclusive, as you can imagine, because there are so many different family members going in and out of the house, they're touching everything, their DNA is going to be all over everything regardless, and that is the problem with huge family murders that happen in the home. And although David had blood smears on his body, they were thought to be consistent with those of someone who had just found his family deceased and ran over to try to help them and got a little bit of blood on him. As for Robin, it was found that he only had his own blood on himself, which would make it so he did not murder his entire family because there was no other blood stains from the rest of the family members on him. However, the defense then said that this was because he actually took off the green jumpsuit he was wearing wearing while he murdered everyone, put it in the laundry basket before shooting himself. And of course, then David came home through the laundry that was in the laundry basket and with his clothing and just went on his merry way because that's what he always did. Next on the gun, Robin's fingerprints were found on the barrel of the gun, which could have been because he was trying to push the gun out of his face if it was being shoved in his face before he was shot. And David's fingerprints was found on the actual handle of this gun. But, like we said previously, this was David's gun and he often took it out for hunting, so it could have possibly been fingerprints from before when he previously used it. Prosecutors felt as though they had a pretty decent case against David, and after three weeks of trial, David Bain was found guilty and he was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole for 16 years. However, many believed this was a very weak case against him and that it should not have been enough to send him to prison for murder. He applied for appeals many times and then in 2007, he would be granted one because businessman and ex-rugby player Joe Karam took on his case and he was granted a retrial because Joe Karam really felt as though something was off about this case that David wasn't the murderer and Joe was the one who really campaigned for it to be retried and just to be open in the public once again to get the news out there and to hopefully get David out of prison. The retrial started on March 6, 2009 and David pled not guilty to all charges. During this trial, of course, the defense argued that Robin was the one who committed all of these murders before taking his own life and this trial lasted about three months. With less than a day of jury deliberation, David was actually found not guilty and was acquitted of all charges. By this point though, he had already served 13 years of his 16 year life sentence and missed out on a lot of opportunities in life. He was really struggling to find work in part simply because of how many advances that we've seen in technology in the past few decades. He didn't know how to work the computers and new devices that were now a part of pretty much every workplace, so he actually applied for compensation. New Zealand gave him a very hard time because they just didn't want to compensate him, but he did end up receiving a grant for about 925,000 New Zealand dollars, which is about 582,000 US dollars. So at this point, there really isn't justice for the family and many people have their different theories about who they believe is responsible and people are still talking about this case to this day. Many people believe that Robin was the one responsible. He seemed to have the biggest motive and seemed to be in a very negative mental state right before the murders took place. Again, he was living in a rundown trailer in the backyard of his home, and when he wasn't living there, he was living at the school where he worked. There are rumors that he had a sexual relationship with his own daughter, and she may have come out and told the entire family about it, and of course, this would be absolutely devastating for everyone to find out what was going on. Obviously, if his marriage was failing and all of these other factors were at play, it makes sense why he would have the perfect motive for this crime. But then on the other hand, a lot of evidence that we went over earlier points pretty much towards David. 
the gun used in the crime does belong to David. There were those 25 minutes that he wasn't really able to account for and he was the one who threw the green jumper into the washing machine, cleaning it of any usable evidence. But in my opinion, I just don't see much of a motive. Yes, he could have wanted that money and maybe he was also feeling the stress of his father living outside and living at the school. There was probably a lot of stress and drama on the entire family during this time, but to me, I just don't see why this would make him want to kill his entire family. There could be a lot more at play that we are just unaware of, but I just don't think that there's enough evidence to say that David has a very strong motive for this crime. Either way, after the retrial, David had tried his best to go on to live a normal life. He worked as an engineer and got married in May of 2017, where he legally changed his name to William Davies after taking his wife's last name. However, years and years after the trial and retrial has ended, as early as last month, new witnesses had come out saying that they saw David standing outside of the home, returning from his newspaper route around 7 a.m., nine minutes before the 111 call was made, and after the time that someone had turned on the computer and written that message. So this supports the fact that David was not home when these murders took place and accounts for the 25 minutes of time that David was not able to account for. He says that he was just in complete shock after finding his entire family dead, which is very understandable and that's why he didn't call as soon as maybe he should have according to police. But according to these witnesses, they did see him staggering around the street for a little bit before calling 911. So that completely agrees with the theory that he didn't do this and he was just in a dazed and in confused state after finding his entire family dead. And again, these witnesses put him outside only nine minutes before the call was made, not 25, which is a perfectly reasonable amount of time to go running through your house, finding everyone dead, being in a complete state of shock, and then calling the authorities. But then again, this does contradict David's own statements and other witnesses who do put him at the house at 6.45 a.m. So we don't really know how true these witnesses are. Also, we have to wonder, of course, why they are just now, so many years later, coming out with this information. Well, according to these witnesses, they actually did try to come forward with this information to police, but police claim that they have absolutely no record of this. They also said that they tried contacting David's defense attorney, but they were ignored. So according to them, it's not for a lack of trying. But of course, either way, David was acquitted of these charges and these witnesses have a sighting that further supports his innocence. It's just unfortunate that they came out so many years later rather than it being found out when the trial was going on, the first trial, so that he wasn't put in jail in the first place. So that's pretty much all of the information that we have on this case. There is so much information that leads me in both directions that I really don't know who I think is responsible. When looking at the motive, I definitely think that Robin had a lot more reason to kill his entire family than David. However, the evidence does point more towards David being responsible than Robin. The one thing that doesn't make sense to me in this entire thing is why would Robin throw on that green jumper? kill his entire family, then decide to throw the green jumper in the laundry before taking his own life. If he really was just going to take his own life after doing this, why would he really even care about the jumper being clean, especially if it was his own jumper, not anyone else's? And if it wasn't just to be clean, why would he want to get rid of evidence? That part just doesn't make sense to me. Clearly, if he wanted to kill his family and he was the one who did it and he really did write that message in the computer, why would he want to frame his son for this if he's the only one that deserves to stay? It just does not make sense to me. But honestly, everything else in this case does kind of support Robin wanting to kill his family, but again, we don't really know. But honestly, Everything else in this case just simply does not seem like strong enough evidence to definitively point me in one direction for sure. If I did have to pick someone on who I think is more likely responsible, 
I would have to say Robin, but that's just what I think and we don't actually know. So now I want to hear from you guys. Who do you think is responsible? Do you think that David wanted to kill his entire family for a monetary gain? Or do you think that Robin maybe snapped and killed his whole family? Please let us know in the comments below. I just want to say thank you so much, Rachel, for allowing me to be on your channel and discuss this case. It truly means the world that we can all be so supportive of each other. Here in this true crime community, I am absolutely in love with your content and I just think you put so much love and effort into each video you post. So just a special thank you for you. And thank you for all of you watching too. I hope you enjoyed our collab. If you liked this video, please make sure to leave this video a thumbs up and go ahead and check out the video that I made with Brooke on her channel. It is a wild ride, guys. Make sure to subscribe to mine and Brooke's channels for true crime and mystery videos. Also, make sure to follow our social medias. Both will be linked in the description box below. If you have absolutely any case suggestions that you would like to see here on my channel, please make sure to send them to my email at rachelshannoncases at gmail.com. Also, if you wish to help me support my channel, please go ahead and check out my Patreon link below. With that, I hope you guys have a fantastic week and I hope to see you next time. Bye.